hey guys welcome back to digital Srini channel on YouTube and if you have watched my previous video from last week you learned about how we can use global average pooling layer to localize features or how we can potentially use that to localize features in images so we're going to use exactly that technique in fact this is an extension of that discussion that we had last week here we plan on using this global average pooling layer or leveraging this gap layer in localizing anomalies in images so in each of these images you can see that there are certain anomalies and i'm actually uh, plotting this as a uh, heat map to identify these anomalies and then put a uh, box around it so this is the plan for this video and if that makes sense to you obviously continue watching this video so let's not waste any more time jump directly into the code and walk through this line by line and do not worry i'll share the code with you so please pay attention to uh, what i'm trying to show here and then work on your own time so let's jump into the code as usual i'm working in my spider ide because i love it i can see all the variables up here i can see the output right here and uh, it doesn't matter what ide you work on so i'm just giving you information on what i'm using here okay and also as long as i'm giving you information uh, on what i'm using here the data set that i'm going to use is the malarial data set you can download this from uh, from this link in fact if you download it you would see a uh, folder called cell images within that cell images to two uh, folders or directories if you want to call them one is labeled uninfected the other one is parasitized if I open uninfected you can see I have 500 items 500 images of all the cells just basically these are all uninfected so they look as clean as possible well I don't know why they put that in uninfected but you see some that can questionably I mean this one for example it seems to have some sort of a parasite but anyway someone labeled that as uninfected we'll work with that if you go to parasitized then you can see that it looks very similar to uninfected except obviously you see some parasites in here so we are going to set this thing up as binary classification and when we load the the idea is when we load this parasitized it should be able to highlight where these parasites are and then just draw a box for us and it can be one or many it's not just one that we are looking for how many ever parasites just show me that as a hotspot and put a red box right around it that's the plan so let us jump in and go ahead and import the required libraries and all of these should be pretty much standard for you the only thing again this is the one that we are using from last week but this is the one that's going to help us out in localizing these uh, features so we're going to average each of the feature maps in the last convolutional layer and that's what we're using uh, instead of using flattening before going to the dense output layer so that's that and anything else that's new yeah scipy i'm going to import scipy this is not something that i normally import i'm doing that because uh, when i upsample my feature map later on i am going to use my scipy so i can just use the dot zoom function and then just go ahead and uh, and and uh, zoom in or increase the resolution or the size of my uh, of my low resolution image I'm not talking about improving the resolution I'm just talking about improving the pixel size uh, when we go uh, when we use scipy and these libraries should be pretty much straightforward okay so uh, as you just saw my data is in two directories parasitized and uninfected so I'm going to load each image in each of these folders and uh, capture that as part of my data set array or list for now and for each image that actually comes from parasitized folder, I'm going to add a, a label of one. And for the ones from uninfected, I'm going to add a label of zero. Finally, I'm gonna convert the list into a NumPy array. So this is something I have done many, many times in the past. So let's go ahead and run that. Now, we'll have uh, 500 images, total 1000 images, 500 each uh, for each class. Let's go ahead and split that into training and testing data. Again, no explanation there. We just split our data set into train and test 20% to the test size. And we have to scale our inputs because these are all 8-bit images with values going from 0 to 255, which means I'm dividing it by 255 to scale them to between 0 to 1. Normally, I would not do any one-hot encoding for this binary classification because we're going to use sigmoid activation function and then we set a threshold to convert that into binary. Now, I am converting that to categorical for a couple of reasons. One, primarily, 
to make sure that this same code can be extended to multi-class classification. Because this is anomaly, where by definition we are saying one is normal, the other one is anomaly. In my case, uninfected is normal and the parasitized is anomaly. I am going to uh, I'm going to uh, convert that into a two-class multi-class classification problem, and I can apply softmax and I can get for each of these classes, like uh, uninfected and parasitized, I can actually get the weight maps later on. Again, that's the plan. But first step, we need to convert our, uh, our labels into categorical because we are defining this as multi-class classification and we plan on using uh, a categorical cross entropy as the loss function. So let's go ahead and convert this to categorical. Now let's define the model. I am going to use pre-trained VGG. In fact, I should have explained that when we loaded this, uh, these libraries. So here I'm uh, from keras.applications, I'm using VGG 16. So that's exactly what I plan on uh, importing down here. So the plan is down, uh, get the VGG 16 without the dense layers, as you can see, include top equals to false, right? So without the dense layers, but also download the weights that the model has been trained on ImageNet dataset. So now we have a good starting point. And then you can choose to train the entire VCG model with starting weights as ImageNet weights, or you can do what I'm trying to do. First, I actually tried to uh, set block four and block five of this VCG model as trainable, everything else as fixed. Uh, and then I, I don't know why I changed my mind. Now I am setting block five as trainable. Yeah, and all others as non-trainable. So block five and the uh, is trainable, that's pretty much it. So let us go ahead and define the model and oh yeah, important point. So that's not trainable and the output of that is connected to global average pooling 2D. We'll print out the model and, and study that in a second, but I just wanna give you the output here would be two outputs, right? One representing uninfected, one representing infected. Remember, this is a multi-class classification setup that I'm trying to do here, which means our activation function should be softmax, not a binary anymore. And our loss is categorical cross entropy. And I'm using stochastic gradient descent, or you can use Adam, try whatever makes sense. So this is it. This is very simple model, and you do not have to use VGG16. You can define your own model from scratch. I'm just using this, but you can define anything from scratch. The whole point is, add global average pooling, that's it. So let's go ahead and run this function and define the model with an input shape of 224 by 224 by three. Again, I'm using 224, 224, three because BGG16 uh, typically, I mean, it's basically if you're including the dense layers, you're forced to use 224 by 224 by three. But if you're only using uh, convolutional layers like I'm doing, you could have actually defined this for 256 by 256 by three or something. But anyway, I'm, I'm just sticking with 224 for now. So let's go ahead and get the model and it will be downloading the image net weights if you already do not have that. And apparently I put a print statement somewhere to print the layer names and it's printing block one, con one, all the way to block four, con with three. It's not printing block five. I believe this model has block five, but let's go ahead and print the model summary right there. So if you look at the summary of this model, so there you go. You can see block one, block two, block three, block four, block five, and global average pooling. And block five is set to trainable. Up to block four is not trainable. That's why I'm just printing the layer dot name up to that point. So up to what point is not non-trainable? Up to block four con three is non-trainable, which means up to this point, it's non-trainable. And once it gets to block five, it's trainable. So all of these layers are trainable, wherever you have these trainable parameters and everything else is non-trainable. That's how we defined this. And now you can see that the last convolutional layer here has a size of 14 by 14 by 512. And then comes the pooling layer, which pools this 14 by 14 and you get seven by seven. This is just max pooling. And then comes global average pooling. Normally you have flatten here, where all of these are flattened into that many, uh, that many nodes, but we are using global average pooling. What does global average pooling do? For each of these images, in this case, each of this image is only seven by seven pixel wide. So for, you can call that feature maps, right? So for each of these, it's just averaging all these 49 values 
and giving you the averaged value. So you have 512 values of averaged seven by sevens. So that's exactly why you end up with 512 right there after global average pooling and you connect that to your final dense layer. That's the prediction layer where you have two outputs, uninfected or parasitized. I hope this makes sense. And later on, we are going to take this 512 weights and multiply with this the output, sorry, with this one, the output of the last convolutional layer upscale to the original image size and we multiply that. So we're going to upscale this 14 by 14 by 512 to 224 by 224 by three. And we're going to multiply that with our global average uh, pooling, uh, like right there and then upscale it. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, I'm just jumping ahead uh, to give you more information. So let's go down. So now that we understand the model, Let's go ahead and train it. So let us train for 30 epochs. I think that should be good for now. So let's go ahead and hit the train and you'll see it should start any second now and I'll pause the video until it's done. It should be literally a few seconds, but why stare at the screen while it's uh, training? So let me go ahead and pause the, uh, pause the video. Okay, so after 30 epochs, we got about 96% accuracy. That is very good for this data set. And let us go ahead and look at our training curves. And that looks very good. Very nice, very good. So great, we are all ready. So far, we haven't done anything that uh, that's new to you, I hope, other than the global average pooling layer. If you just replace that with flattening layer, this is nothing but just a binary classification or multi-class classification with two classes. So now let's uh, check the accuracy. I mean, just for the sake of completeness, we know it should be 96 something. So let's check the accuracy. And then more importantly, now it's about 96%. Let's load some random image and then see exactly what the prediction is uh, going to be. Again, these are all sanity checks. It says the prediction for this image is one. And yeah, that's a parasitic image and prediction is one and everything. So this is just to make sure the model is performing good. And final step before we move on is to look at the confusion matrix. Again, 97, 95 and three misclassification five. That's, that's excellent. I'm I'm super happy with this model, which means I can proceed to the next step and then now localize these, uh, these uh, parasites. So first of all, let us identify all images classified as parasitized. So which is, I guess, 95 images. So let's go ahead and get the IDs of wherever my y pred, y pred equals to one, which is parasitized. Just go ahead and give me the ID for that one. So if I just go back and look at uh, parasitized image, parasitized image index, I have uh, 100 of those right there. For, uh, and uh, these are all the IDs right there. Okay, so now that we have our parasitized image uh, from our YPRED, let us go ahead and if you want, you can save all of those images into your hard drive and load them again. Because it's only 100 images, I am going to just save it in a new NumPy array because we can work with these images from now on instead of all images. So let's go ahead and save all of these images into a NumPy array. So now we have predicted as uh, uh, parasited, parasitized, we have 100 images, 224 by 224 by three. Okay, so far so good. Now let's go down and define the key part of our activity here, which is plotting a heat map and the rectangles around it. So how do, first of all, how do you plot a rectangle? I'm going to use from matplotlib, you can use OpenCV if you want. I'm going to use matplotlib.patches. There is a rectangle right there. You just need to provide supply, uh, supply the coordinates. Uh, I hope you know, I hope you know this. You just need to supply the coordinates, line width and line color and all that to draw the rectangle. Also, I'm going to use uh, peak local max. I'm not sure how many of you know about this in scikit image feature dot peak. There is something called peak local max. So if you have a, I hate that, proactive help. Okay, if you have a uh, heat map, 2D heat map, and you're trying to locate hotspots, this can be a great uh, library peak local max. And you can define how many, uh, for example, in this case, I'm defining find up to five peaks. If this is up to five peaks and the threshold relative is 0 0.5. That means in relation to the highest peak, 
the other peaks must have at least 0.5% of that intensity. Otherwise, if you just say find number of peaks equals to five, it will find just five peaks. They're probably not even peaks. Maybe you only have one peak. So if you have any number of peaks and you only want to get the top five or top one, top two, top three, make sure you, uh, you, you set these thresholds and also the minimum distance between the peaks if, you, if that's uh, important for you. Okay, so that's these two libraries. That's these two. So let's go ahead and run those two lines. And now let's move down to plotting the heat map. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we are going to uh, predict on our image. Now let's say we have an image. You load the image. We are doing model.predict. So far, you know, this is the prediction. And now let's get the prediction class. Is this uh, parasitized or is this uh, uninfected? Well, in, the, in our case, this is going to be parasitized. So you know the prediction class. And then let's get the last layer weights, weights of the last layer, which is our prediction layer right there. Okay, so go ahead and get the weights of the prediction layer. And then last layer weights for the prediction. When you get the last layer weights, you get a list of two. One for uh, the weights for it to be, un, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uninfected looking for words, and waits for it to be parasitized, right? Because our output is two. The last layer has two outputs because we have two classes. So you have two weights, two sets of weights. So we need to get the weights for the prediction. That's why we want the prediction class. So you get the weights for the prediction right there. Why do you need weights for the prediction? Because we're going to use that uh, in a minute. So, and for the last convolutional uh, layer, I should say that should have been layer, not model. For the last convolutional model, which uh, layer, which is our block five con three, right? So if we go back, I hope I still have the model printed somewhere. Yeah. If you go to the last convolution layer, block five con three, right? After that, it's just the pooling and then uh, global average pooling. So for the last one, let's go ahead and uh, define that as a model and then predict on that. What do you get? The output. Basically, I'm trying to get the output at this point, which will be 14 by 14 by 512. So that one will be 14 by 14 by 512. And uh, np.squeeze, basically the output would be 1 by 14 by 14 by 512. So this step will make it 14 by 14 by 512. Okay, so far. Now, I want to upscale this 14 by 14 by 512 to my 224 size image. So I need the multiplication factor. So it's nothing but 224 because that's my input image size, right? 224 divided by 14. So that's the multiplication factor. Same with this side. And now I will be upsampling my 14 by 14 by 512 into a 224 by 224 uh, image. And I'm going to use scipy.nd image.zoom. And these are the multiplication factors by this factor zoom. Okay, that's what that is. And once I have that, once I have this, now I can generate my heat map. How am I going to do that? It's a dot product. It's a product between this, the upsampled image, because we want to see the original size image, between that and, let me create some more room so it's easy for us to see. Okay, so the upsampled image has, again, 512 of these filters because our size is 14 by 14 by 512, we upsample that to 224. So you have 224 by 224 by 512. So we take that 512 feature maps and each of that, we are going to multiply that with our last layer weights for prediction. Okay, we are going to multiply that and reshape that into our original image shape, which is 224 by 224. Please go through this one more time and uh, make sure you understand that step, okay? And all of that is possible because we have our global average uh, pooling layer right there. So that's exactly what we are trying to do here. So uh, just to repeat one more time, we took this last convolutional layer, 14 by 14 by 512, we upscaled it up back to, we don't care about pixel resolution at that point, right? We are not trying to reconstruct our original image. We are trying to generate a heat map. So zooming is okay. Like any type of interpolation to, to, to increase the size is okay. That's exactly what we are doing. So 14 by 14 by 512 to 224 by 224 by 512 is what we did. And then we are taking the, uh, the, the, the last 
layer right here, layer from uh, the, the weights from the last layer right there. And we are multiplying that with, I'm sorry, and we're multiplying that with our, uh, with our upsampled image and study the weight, uh, weights right there. And you'll see that you'll have 512 of these weights because you have global average pooling layer as the one, uh, uh, as the layer that you have before, uh, before the dense layer. I hope that makes sense. And then we are going to generate a heat map. Uh, sorry, we are, that is my heat map. And in my case, I have images where there is dark area outside. So I just want to, wherever it is dark, just drop my heat map values to zero. I don't want hot spots around the edges or anything. So this is zero. That's exactly the step. You don't need to follow this step if your images are full. You know, uh, uh, if your objects are filling this image fully. So that's the step I'm doing here. And then to get the peak coordinates, because in this case, I'll probably find a peak right there. How do you get the peak coordinates? I just talked about the peak local maximum. So number of peaks up to five, and I get the coordinates. Once I get the coordinates, it's just a matter of uh, plotting it. So first I'm going to plot my image, and then I'm going to plot my heat map with an alpha of 0 0.3 so we can see through it and then it overlays onto our image. And I am going to put rectangles where? Wherever I have my X and Y. And I get X and Y from my peak coordinates right there. That's it. So let's run these lines. I hope I have no clue where I stopped. <laughs> so let us run everything. Uh, yeah, we did the heat map for sure. Oh, sorry, the confusion map for sure. So let's go ahead and do these lines up to here and we should be all set after this. So now let's uh, load a random image from our parasitized, uh, parasitized images, uh, 100, one of these 100 images, and let's go ahead and plot the heat map. So let us do that, and you should be able to see, there you go, a box right here. Now, if you're confused about, okay, what, what's going on at every step, go ahead and remove this from this function and run this line by line. So for example, if I define my, uh, shall I do that? Okay, why not? Let's explain this. Let's just do my image is that. Okay, this is my image. And let's go ahead and show the image. Okay, this is my original image. You see how there is parasi uh, parasitized right there. Now let's go back and start from here. Model.predict or pred. Or pred, pred, pred is one by two, right? So you have two predictions. And then we have predict class. What class is it? predict class, it's class one, parasitized. And then last layer weights. What are our last layer weights? If I go to last layer weights, you see 512 by two up here. So there are 512 of these, but two of them. One for parasitized, one for uninfected. We just get the parasitized one because that's our class. So last layer weights for our prediction is only 512, okay? And then comes last convolution model, block five, column three, and we're going to use that dot predict, which should give us 14 by, what, what did we call last con output right there? One by 14 by 14 by 512. And we need to drop that one. So let's just go ahead and do NP dot squeeze. So 14 by 14 by 512. Let's upscale this back to 224, whatever that size was. Uh, let's go ahead and do run these lines and we should have up sample last con output up sample last con output as 224 by 224 by 512 so this 512 we are going to do the dot product right there with the, the with this last con output which is 512 and when you do that it is going to give us 224 by 224 image heat map heat map heat map right there 224 by 224 and we can go ahead and plot that heat map so when i plot that heat map plt dot show what did we call heat map when you plot that you'll see that there is a lot of stuff going on outside the region of interest so i'm going to just drop those pixels to zero outside my my cell so now when i plot my heat map it makes it's a bit more clear you can see the boundary now I want to overlay this onto my original image. That's exactly what I'm trying to do at this point. So first of all, let's go ahead and look at peak coordinates. And there is only one peak here. So if you go to peak coordinates, peak, peak coordinates right there, 
there you go there is only one and these are the coordinates and that's what we are x and y and that's what we are going to use to plot this i hope that makes sense and let's let's do this for a few more images let's load another random image and look at the localized information right there you see that's where the parasitized information is let's do one more and end this video so there you go ah, it's in the center sorry i lied let's do one more and okay that's fine uh, and how does that actual uh, image looks like look like so here it is let's plot it so there you go and here is where that localized information is and you can apply this to any type of uh, anomaly type of data set so go ahead and look for anomaly data sets if you don't have one it can be a fabric with some sort of a clean fabric and fabric with some snag or some hole or something and when you plot it it clearly shows you exactly where that localized information is why is this useful just imagine connecting this to a device that collects images so you have your fabric coming and you take these images continuously and in one place it says hey there is something going on it's an anomaly then you can automatically adjust the optics of your imaging system to image that at high magnification and get more information of uh, what happened there like why did it snag because this gives you the coordinates that's the important point once you get the coordinates you can go back to your acquisition whatever whether it is a camera or a microscope or a telescope and then guide it to the right direction okay i hope you guys found this video to be useful in the next video let's extend pretty much the same thing to multi-class classification using our cfar uh, data set i mean cfar model and all the uh, cfar classes so uh, let's meet again in the next uh, tutorial and please like these videos guys if you really happen to like them. Thank you.